This is Chronicle on WCBB Channel 5. A cold February night. UMass student Maura Murray spins her car into a snowbank. Witnesses call the police. She was only alone from between three to seven minutes. But when authorities arrive, Maura Murray is gone. One minute she's here, one minute she's not. What happened that February night? What sent her to New Hampshire? She had a phone conversation with a family member, which for whatever reason was very upsetting. Was she abducted from the scene of the accident? I'm thinking somebody probably offered her some help. Or did she run away to start over? I think Moore realized she had an opportunity to escape all the troubles in her life. Ten years of questions. My daughter's missing. I, I, I don't know what happened to her. Missing. Next. On Chronicle. It's been 10 long years since 21 year old Maura Murray's photo first appeared on missing posters and in news reports. It is a real mystery. One minute she's here, one minute she's not, and there's just so many theories. Maura Murray grew up in Hanson, Massachusetts. From all accounts, she was a superstar. A talented athlete, she was also top of her class academically, earning her a coveted spot at West Point. But two years later, Maura enrolled at UMass Amherst and pursued her passion of nursing. She had a solid group of girlfriends at home and at school, a caring boyfriend, all of them have tried to piece together what happened that February night when Maura Murray went missing. None of them can say whether she is dead or living, living a lie. Here is what we know. Just after 4 p.m. Monday, February 9, 2004, Maura Murray packed a bag and walked out of her dorm and into her car. First, she stopped at the ATM machine and withdrew almost her entire balance, $280. Next, she drove to a liquor store and purchased a bottle of vodka, Kahlua, Bailey's, and a box of red wine. Then, she headed north. At 7 p.m. that night, in the darkness, Murray was navigating the twists and turns of Route 112 in Haverhill, New Hampshire. That's when she failed to make a hairpin turn. And she just spun out, did a 180, and hit a snowbank, and it was not a hard collision. The car radiator was damaged. Neighbors looked out their window and saw Mora standing outside her car. Records show they immediately called police. A few minutes later, a bus driver, Butch Atwood, pulled up and asked Mora if she needed help. She declined. Atwood drove 300 feet to his cabin, and against Mora's wishes, he called 911. New Hampshire State Police Lieutenant John Scarinza was on the case. He first spoke to Chronicle a few months after the accident. She told the witness that she had made a phone call to AAA on her cell phone. In reality, there is no cell phone coverage in that area. Police arrive on the scene less than 10 minutes after the first call to find Maura Murray's car locked and Maura nowhere in sight. There was no injury, so they searched on foot and in vehicles. Basically, what they were looking for was A, a person walking, or B, footprints in the snow. They found none. Fred Murray's phone rang late Tuesday afternoon. My daughter Kathleen told me that uh, my daughter Mara had uh, gone missing the night before. I tried for the rest of Tuesday night to call and find out what happened, but I didn't get much information at all. Nearby residents had expected to see police at the scene Tuesday morning. There was no one looking for her along the roadway during the daylight hours for several days. I never saw anyone come down this way. I went there with the idea of joining the search. <clears throat> I was the search. I was the only person there on Wednesday morning. It wasn't until Wednesday Maura Murray became a missing person. A comprehensive search began two days too late says Fred Murray. I want to know what happened in the first 36 hours. I want to know what the state police officer at the scene did. An adult has the ability and the legal right to go where they want and do as they please as long as they don't break the law. And so you can't jump to the conclusion 
the, that they've been the victim of foul play. Initially, this appeared to be an automobile accident. Left inside the car were Mora's duffel bag, books, MapQuest directions to New Hampshire and Vermont, and an empty Coca-Cola bottle containing remnants of red wine. Missing were her backpack as well as the bottles of vodka and Kahlua. Not unusual when people get in accidents and they've got baggage of some kind, whether they're impaired or for some other reason, just their first thought is, I'm out of here. Her frame of mind is not to stay there and wait for the police. Authorities say Maura Murray was struggling with some personal issues the week before she left. The Thursday prior to her car accident, she had a phone conversation with a family member, which for whatever reason was very upsetting to Mara to the point where her supervisor at work relieved her of duty and walked her to her dorm room just to make sure everything was okay. Clearly she was upset. Mora was juggling a busy class schedule, doing a nursing rotation and working two jobs. The Saturday before she disappeared, her father drove to Amherst to help Mora buy a car. They had dinner and driving her dad's car, she dropped him off at his motel. Then she went to an on-campus party where friends say she was drinking. At 2.30 a.m., she hit a guardrail. And did substantial damage to the car in the vicinity of eight to $10,000. I think that she was very, very upset over it. Um, my dad wasn't that upset over it. Okay, it's done. There's nothing we can do. Let's get the insurance information. Let's fix this. But I think she probably felt like she let him down and probably beat herself up too much over that. Just hours before Mora left UMass, she boxed up all her belongings and left her boyfriend, Army Lieutenant Bill Rausch, an email and a voicemail saying she promised to talk soon. She also emailed her professors saying there was a death in her family and she would be away for the remainder of the week. She took off. She had a reason. It wasn't the reason that she told everybody. There was no family emergency. There wasn't anything like that. There was something going on with her that caused her to leave. And again, it could have absolutely no connection to what happened to her. Or maybe it does, but we don't know. But why would Maura Murray lie? We've heard from her father mm -hmm. and a sister. She comes from a big family. She has two brothers, two sisters, extended family as well, all, of course, caring about what happened to Mara. Um, her parents were divorced. Her mom passed away in 2009, never knowing what happened. Her dad, um, really, his message when we were speaking with him, most importantly, is the 36 hours. That mm -hmm. 36 hours he feels was missed and the most important hours of somebody going missing and he really desperately wants FBI at this point to get involved question is how much can they do 10 years later hmm. up next a run-in with the law she gets in trouble for using somebody else's credit card number She was in a state of crisis. People around her, I don't think, really assessed the depth of that crisis until she vanished. Was Mora overwhelmed by life? After the accident, could she have intentionally walked into the cold, dark woods? Everything was great. She was doing great. You know, I don't know why she went up there, but it certainly wasn't to commit suicide. Would she have accepted a ride with someone she didn't know? I'm thinking somebody probably offered her some help and she didn't see any other choice at the time. Or did she continue north into Canada, escaping to a new life? If anybody can pull this off, it's, it's Maura. She's bright and she's tenacious. And, you know, one day I hope that she comes out and, and tells us the rest of the story. Why do you think Maura told people there was a death in the family? And oh, just to take the heat off her so she could go away. That's no big deal. I mean, just to lay groundwork to get back in. Now you have an excused absence. If she didn't want to come back, why bother making an excuse? I mean, she has got a homework box in the back seat. At first, friends were not alarmed when they heard Maura's car was found in New Hampshire. In my mind, for Mara, New Hampshire was always a place where, you know, she could clear her head or she could relax or had good memories with her family. Whatever was going on in her mind, she saw that as a place where she could go to sort things out. 
but this time, Laura hadn't mentioned where she was going. We know on the way to New Hampshire from her cell phone records that she called Go Stow, a website in Vermont, and then she called the owner of a condominium where her family spent a lot of time up in Bartlett, New Hampshire. I view those things as something traumatic happened, time for a break. Maura called about a reservation, but didn't make one at either location. James Renner has a theory. She wasn't looking for a one-person hotel room. She was looking for a two-person hotel room. And I believe that she was traveling in tandem with somebody. Also explains how she disappeared so quickly from the side of the road up in New Hampshire. She was only alone from between three to seven minutes at most. She was in plain view of three houses. Nobody saw her walk away. There's no footprints going into the snow. Ohio journalist and crime writer James Runner runs a website, My Search for Maura Murray. He's also written a book on the case. He is certain Maura is alive and well. And I believe the plan was to stay in New Hampshire or Vermont for the night and then to cross the Canadian border. So I think she got into this accident up in New Hampshire. Whoever she was traveling with in this other vehicle ahead of her, they turned around and they picked her up and they got out of there. Could Renner be right? Probability of her living a life somewhere else is, is probably um, the least likely, but, it, it, but it's not off the table. It's, nothing's off the table. Renner says he uncovered several reasons why Mora may have wanted to disappear. One, a case of credit card fraud. She gets in trouble for using somebody else's credit card number to order around $80 worth of food. The police catch her. She gets in trouble for that. They take her picture, they run a report, and she goes in front of a judge down there, and the judge says, hey, look, you're young, you're ambitious, you, you come from West Point, we're going to give you a chance. If you can stay out of trouble for six months, we're going to wipe this clean. Renner says the accident with her father's car would have jeopardized her record. Now, she's going to be charged for that accident. At the very least, she's going to be charged with a failure to control that vehicle. I believe at that point she realized that that prior credit card trouble that she was facing was going to come back. I think Moore realized she had an opportunity to escape all the troubles in her life, and she had an opportunity to leave all this behind and start over. And I think that's why she climbed into her car and drove up into the North Country. Those claims that Renner made that she was going to be charged for that accident in her dad's car, police would neither confirm or deny that. Mm -hmm. And the family wants nothing to do with Renner. He's writing a book about this, and they don't like what he's been writing on his website. So there's no communication between hmm. them. Next, the detecting goes digital. Internet sleuths are hunting down leads on websites, forums, crowdsourcing the investigation. As days turned into weeks and months turned into years, Maura Murray's family and friends continue to look for answers. No credible sightings since the night she's been missing. State police have received reports of sightings, but none have been credible. To this day, we don't know exactly what happened to Maura. Not one piece of personal effect, clothing, a bag, book, there were no remnants of anything that Maura Murray had with her that night when she walked away from that vehicle. Nothing's been found. And we've done quite a bit of searching up there. Now the search has gone digital and viral. Internet sleuths are hunting down leads on websites, forums, blogs, and message boards. And everyone in this virtual community has a theory. We regularly monitor blogs and uh, internet postings associated with this case. Especially early on, we actually had a couple of guys participated under a pseudo identity and interacted with people. Because if we're doing it, the bad guy, the, the perpetrator, right. could be doing it too. And, and that's why these blogs are good, but you have to be careful about what you put out there. We're averaging about mm, two or three thousand a week. Is it? On the website, there were times when we would have almost 50,000 in a day. 
Helena Dwyer Murray is Mora's aunt and manager of the Mora Murray Facebook page and website. She also ran a forum, but shut it down. People start bickering, and it's very difficult to read it, even if you're not participating in it. You know, they've said some horrible things about me, about Fred, about everybody. It, it gets can get very nasty, but on the opposite side, you've got some people who have just been wonderful, have followed her from the beginning. The do-it-yourselves detectives not only debate each other, they are posting pictures which have generated possible sightings. We've had sightings from other countries. We've had sightings from photos on different websites. We've had a sighting of her in a television show audience. Things like that, it really runs the gamut of, of all these different circumstances, but none of them have panned out. Still, every lead is investigated by the cold case unit. You have to because the next one that comes in potentially could be something useful or something helpful uh, because the bottom line is in this case anything's possible. Frustrated by the lack of answers, Fred Murray took the state of New Hampshire to court for access to the files pertaining to his daughter's case. The court ruled against Murray, stating the information could not be released in an ongoing investigation. Most of the documents remain sealed. I can't imagine what Fred feels after losing his daughter. They call it closure in the psychology world. He hasn't got closure. He needs it. He's being a typical dad. He's not going to quit. James Renner isn't going to quit either. In December, he headed to Canada in search of Mora. We had these tips on various message boards dating back to 2005. I traveled up to Canada in December to try and find her, you know, track down these leads. We stopped at this gym and uh, the manager uh, was adamant. She said, yes, I've seen this woman. Whether or not it's Mora or a lookalike, I don't know. Wow. New Hampshire State Police have had suspects, though, in this case. They have. They've, they've gotten search warrants. They've done searches of homes. They have never charged anyone. And by the way, the two private investigators that we have been interviewing, they're working on this case pro bono. They both believe that Mora is no longer alive. Hmm. Next, a father's sorrow. James Renner did not find Maura Murray living under an assumed name in Canada. However, he trusts the many contributors to his blog who believe they may have seen Maura, who would now be 31. Improbable, say police, disappearing is not easy. Anywhere you go is going to want an ID. If you're going to work for a living, they're going to need a social security number. Um, it's very difficult to do, even to work under the table for a long time, because then eventually you're going to have a health care issue and have to go to a hospital, and they're going to require information from you. I hope that she's out there, and I hope that she has a great life, and I hope she's doing much better. I hope she's found a family. I don't want to imagine that she's in a basement, you know, uh, and we have another Ariel Castro case on our hands. I think that's very, very unlikely. It's an image that I like to have of her out there somewhere living a, a, a better life. Fred Murray says he will not rest until Mora is found. With every new lead, he makes the trek up to Haverhill, New Hampshire, hoping to find something that will unlock the mystery. I think, I'd, yeah, somebody grabbed him, maybe somebody listening on a scanner. I'm not somebody, if Mora were alive, she'd have called me. I'm sure of that. And if not me, one of, the, one of her sisters. You know, that she, she wasn't running from her family. I don't think I'll ever know what happened to my daughter. Maura Murray's friends have all moved on. Many are married and now have children. They fondly remember the last night they spent with their friend. We went to dinner. Everything was normal at dinner. The happy-go-lucky self that she normally was. There was no, no signs of anything that was wrong. Mara never hid anything that I can remember. You know, sometimes you get really angry at her. You're like, why did you do this? What are the answers? But it's, you know, it's been so long that at this point, I just either, in my mind, I want to think whatever happened, I hope she either didn't suffer or she's not suffering. If she is off and has created a new life, I hope she's happy. I still look at the whole situation and feel like I'm living a Lifetime movie or something like that, not real life. Ten years and still no answers. All that remains is hope. I have to maintain 
that hope that she is alive somewhere and she could come walking through the door and and if I ever lose that then I've done her a disservice so no I don't ever lose lose hope my daughter's missing I, I, I don't know what happened to her it doesn't end because she is still missing I can't just say Oh, well, that's probably that, and boom, and shut the door. And there's no such thing. And it's a constant quest. When Fred and I were talking, we were saying how Maura would be 31, and he said, yeah, I imagine that she'd be married and she'd have kids at this point, and he's never going to give up. He mm. wants answers, and he will search until he gets them. And every little tentacle of this leads to another mystery, it seems like. There's yes. just no answer to almost any of it. And so much speculation. Right. And that's all they have right now. Mm -hmm. Great story. That is Chronicle for tonight. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm Anthony Everett. I'm Jason Monahan. We hope to see you back here tomorrow night for Chronicle 730. Good night. Next Chronicle, romantic love. It was really nice. It was really fun. He paid, and it was a good time. Parents' love. She is very much my child. Heartwarming love. I know I can count on him no matter what. Chronicle's love stories. Chronicle tomorrow.